Hi, I'm Louisa Whitney and I'm here with Una Archer. Hi Una. Hi Lisa. Hi. And today we're going to be talking about a simple way to think about co-parenting. And the goal of co-parenting is to raise happy, healthy and emotionally well and secure children in the circumstances that you've got. And today we're going to be talking about four common sources of pressure and focusing on what your child needs from you now in the present moment and also what help is available to you if you're finding co-parenting challenging at the moment. So my name is Louisa Whitney and I'm a family mediator working with couples who are separating to make arrangements for anything that's important for them and particularly their children and one of my passions is helping parents who are separating to minimise the effects of their separation on their children. Una, do you want to introduce yourself? Mm, sure. I'm a, a psychologist and I help parents to nurture secure, child, uh, secure relationships with their children. So I, I work in the field of uh, attachment and parent-child relationships. And I'm also a mom of two and a separated mom of two for over, um, a separation happened over six years ago now. So, um, you know, everything what I'm saying comes, uh, sort of is filtered through a few filters. So the first one is, you know, professionally, you know, I'll be bringing uh, the most current up-to-date thinking about what it is that children need to feel secure. But then that theory is tried and tested in my own co-parenting journey. And of course, all the parents that I get the privilege to talk to. Wow, I can see how much, uh, how much you bring to this perspective on so many different levels. Mm, I'll, I'll do my best to make it uh, your worthwhile. <laughs> <laughs> to make it worth your while. Right, Lisa. And, you know, before we dive in, you know, I know that you have a wealth of experience as well, uh, helping separated parents to be there for their children. And um, so from your point of view, what are the fundamentals for successful co-parenting? Yeah, I mean, I, when I work with parents, I draw on the experience I had as a lawyer prior to being a mediator when I represented parents who had separated to deal with issues concerning their children in amicable ways and also right through court proceedings. Mm. And in my work as a mediator, where I bring the parents together and I think for me, the fundamentals of co-parenting are being able to have a civil or polite, if possible, relationship with each other in front of the children and being able to communicate with each other about issues concerning your children, whether that's sort of arrangements as to when they're with mum and when they're with dad or whether it's an issue that's cropped up about their schooling or about sort of a behavioural issue that you might both be a bit concerned about. And for me, those are really the kind of fundamentals. And, you know, there's people that build on that and do way more than that. But for me, that's the kind of fundamental building block. What about you, Una? What's your perspective on this? Well, I agree with you. As long as communication is there, you can work through things. And, uh, you know, we'll dive much deeper into this topic um, in, in this video. And um, so, and the way, so Louise and I put a lot of thought into creating this video because we wanted to make it really um, valuable and something that you can just take and use in your parenting and your co-parenting. So we decided to structure it in the following way. So first we will talk about those four pressures that um, you might be feeling as a parent and co-parent. And I understand it might be not the most pleasant way to spend your time thinking about these things, but it's important to, we feel it's important to spell them out because they can be affecting you without you even realizing it. And then, you know, as you listen to this video, treat it as a thinking space. Keep checking in with yourself. Is, is that true for me? Like, is that what it's like for me or not? And, you know, either answer, whether it's a yes or a no, I think is a valuable source of information. Mm. 
Yeah. And if you spot that, you know, there is some sort of pressure that's affecting how you parent and co-parent, then just just knowing that and being able to say, right, that's what's happening for me, creates a little bit of space between you and what's happening. And that's a very, in my eyes, very exciting place to be because, you know, with that knowledge, then you can begin to make different choices, choices that were better for you, choices that were better for your children and for the other parent as well, hopefully. Yeah, I think that sums things up really nicely. You know, I think both of us hope that this is going to be a resource for parents that they can sort of return to and get different things out at different times, depending on what's going on. And I know when I learn things, often different things resonate with me at different times. And I hope that's the case for people watching. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So once we covered those um, four sources of pressure, um, you know, then we'll move on to talking about that um, simple way of thinking about co-parenting. And hopefully it will make more sense once we've made that introduction. Okay, so do we want to start, you know, with talking about those pressures? <sighs> yes, let's. So um, the first area that we want to talk about is, um, um, and that's source number one, is what you have experienced in your relationship with your own parents. Because, you know, understandably, that's such an important relationship and it shapes a lot of what you expect from yourself as a parent and also what you want your child to experience growing up and uh, you know and it can affect um your parenting in a sort of wide range of ways you know starting if you had an amazing experience so you had an amazing dad you felt really close to him he was always there like always at your football games or your ballet performances or whatever and you've lost your dad and you know the pain of losing that. And even though you're finding now co-parenting quite tricky, you know, that the thought of your child not experiencing that relationship with the other parent can be a massive driving force for, um, yeah, for, you know, your decision-making in parenting. And it's equally true if you had um, sort of, more painful experiences growing up you know you had maybe had a mother who was an alcoholic or dad who was a workaholic or separation or health issues meant that one or both of your parents were not really there for you were not emotionally available and you know that pain so well and you can't stand the thought of your child experiencing that and then you know you do whatever you can to protect protect your child um from that and so it's part it's where you come from and um i think it's just worth checking in like how intense it is for you because if, if that pain those emotions are still very real it can feel like literally sitting in a thick cloud of thoughts and emotions that that are very present and when you're in that place, it's very hard to be curious about your child and who they are and what they need and just kind of turn to them and with that open attitude and say, oh, hello, there you are. How are you today? What do you need from me? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Sorry, sorry, Gwen. No, I, I was going to say that really resonates with me from couples I see in mediation. I think for me, it's very relevant what happened for people if their parents separated, because that can bring mm. a lot of pressure to people to either recreate the, what they felt like a, a good or an okay separation to them as a child, or the reverse effect that they just don't want their child to go through what they experienced as a child. And those kind of formative experiences can be so important. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So now moving on to another very important relationship and that is relationship with the other parent of your child and you know I just want to stop for a sec and acknowledge you know just how important that relationship was and maybe still is like when we spent when we're so when you're so close to another person and spend so much time with them 
So over time, it just affects so much how you feel about yourself, how, what you think about the world, how you plan your days. And it does take, you know, when you, separ when you make a decision to separate, that just does not change overnight. And I often think about sort of compare sep separate emotional separation with moving the house. It can take months, like literally months, find a new place to live in, go through all your stuff, move it, unpack it, make it a home. And I believe that the same is true for emotional separation. And um, uh, if, if you want to find out more about it, I would recommend looking up Kubler Ross change of um, uh, change curve. You know, you, um, it sort of talks about the common stages of that. Um, initially, it was grief, but it applies just as much to separation, mm -hmm. denial, uh, frustration, anger, depression, experimentation, and then the last stage of acceptance, where you can accept it that things are different now and you can live with it. And, um, and it's a journey to get to that place of acceptance. And it's, uh, once you're there, probably you would notice that it's much easier to co-parent because you don't have those emotional triggers anymore. And um, ideally, but I know that for a lot of parents, you, you can't like fully completely get there. I guess it's a sort of... Um, uh, something that we strive to yeah. and um, and say for as long as you notice that you are still triggered by the other parent or you have this drive you have this desire for them to approve what you're doing or for them to think that you are a good person um, your co-parenting is still influenced by, by by that relationship yeah um that, that sums up so much for me. And I, I, I think the thing that was coming to me as you were explaining that recovery process is also that there's no set time scale. And I think sometimes mm. people can become quite frustrated with the fact that, oh, it's been six months, surely I should feel better. But, you know, what one person does in six months might take another person two years. And I, I don't know whether you have any sort of views on that time scale. Um, well, if we come back to the analogy of moving the house, you know, <laughs> you have to take that box and move it, otherwise it will just stay there. And yeah, with our emotions, it's not as apparent because, you know, we can kind of cover up and put a brief face on and get on with the day. And I think that's why, you know, so often when a new partner comes into a picture, you know, it can be five years later, all of a sudden the situation erupts because you know, those issues have, have not been dealt with in the first place. Yeah. So, yeah, I agree with you. I don't think there's a, you know, time kind of helps us maybe cover things up, but not necessarily heal. We need to, like, address and process and trans transform things to be able to move on. Yeah, absolutely. I, I like the moving house analogy. I think that's something that most people can relate to. Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. So, Louisa, would like to talk about that, you know, third potential source of pressure. Yeah. Um, and sort of we're now moving out to talk about kind of family and friends and the sort of wider community surrounding parents that are separating. And one of the really important parts of family mediation training is really switching a mediator on to what else might be happening around the couple in front of you because sometimes there can be sort of dynamics or issue be, issues being played out that incorporate other people in the wider family who aren't necessarily in the room physically but can be on a kind of sort of emotional level. And I think that can kind of manifest itself in probably in lots of different ways, but the two ways that often really crop up that I see are friends and family members either being very down on your ex-partner and sort of setting things up to say kind of, you know, I don't know why you're letting them get away with that or I, I have really strong views on how much time they should be spending with the children that you've got together 
all of those kind of things can really make you feel quite confused about <coughs> are you doing the right thing, what's happening, is what you're doing the right thing for your children, you know, they will have been upset lately, so maybe actually your judgment isn't right and maybe you need to listen to other people. All of those kind of thoughts, I think, can start playing in people's heads. And conversely, with the other sort of angle to that, which is that you can have good friends or family members who are saying, you know, I, I don't know why you're separating from that person. They were always really lovely. And, you know, those kind of comments. And again, I think that can be... <laughs> A major factor in people questioning their own judgment you know I don't think anybody makes the decision to separate from their children's other parent in uh, you know uh, in anything other than a, a really considered and agonized decision that's always a really hard mm -hmm. one to make so when you've then got people who you trust or who are a big part of your life questioning your judgment that can really make you question your own judgment about whether you're doing the right thing and whether what you're doing for your children is right. And that can be quite unsettling as a parent as well, I think. Do you have some thoughts on that, Una? Uh, well, I can only agree. I can only agree. I think, um, um, I think you summed it up really well. Shall we move on to the next one? Uh, media. Yeah, and this is something that I can get on my soapbox about because I think Go for it. really, really <laughs> can be so unhelpful. You know, if, if we widen the lens out as a sort of perspective on co-parents and children, the kind of widest angle is looking at what messages people get from, from the media and from television. And the two ones that I think that we really identify with or that I see is either that kind of worst nightmare scenario and that always makes me think of kind of soap operas where you've got two parents that have separated and they have this huge row and you can see the children who are listening in or hearing it and as someone who works with separating parents I, I find that really hard to watch on television because I know it makes good drama and you know, it makes for compelling viewing. But I think it's not something that's helpful to see because, you know, it can sometimes normalise that worst case scenario. And I think for most parents who are separating, they don't want to put their children through seeing those kind of scenes. And certainly all of the research that's been done suggests that it's being exposed and caught up in with that conflict that causes children to have difficulties rather than the, the fact that their parents have separated. So that's definitely one of my sort of bugbears. The kind of other end of the extreme is the kind of, um, I suppose, the sort of utopian separation. And I'm particularly thinking about a lot of the media stories surrounding Gwyneth Paltrow and Chris Martin and the sort of conscious uncoupling. And I want to make it clear, I'm not knocking that kind of idea that you separate constructively and with your children's needs, you know, right at the top of what you're doing. I think that's brilliant and that's what I would encourage people to do. But I think it can be the case that people can often beat themselves up if they're just not in that space and they kind of see this amazing thing happening that's, you know, that's firstly talked about in the media and we don't really know what's happening for that particular family at all but it sets a level of expectation that's so far beyond what I think a lot of people are experiencing that again, it can then make them question themselves and feel that they've got everything wrong just because they're not in that place yet. You know, if we go back to the fundamentals that we talked about at the beginning, actually, if you're able to communicate with each other and you're able to talk to each other in a civil or polite way, that may be enough for you. You don't have to kind of add those extra mm -hmm. levels. So that's certainly something that, you know, I've talked about, I know in blogs before, that expectation that the media sets of how to have a separation, whether it's a sort of really explosive one or whether it's a kind of harmonious and really, really ultimately peaceful one. Mm. So did you hear me on my soapbox? Did it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, loud and clear. Mm. <sighs> say so, I think that brings us to you know the end of the first part and 
I'm just sort of thinking about the parents here watching. Yeah, coming back to that idea that, you know, this is a thinking space. So if you feel like there was a lot of food for thought, you might want to pause this video now and think about, you know, your relationship with your parents, your ex, what's happening with your friends and family, or where they carry some expectations that come from media. And yeah, just check in with what's it like for you and um, if that actually helps you or not. Yeah, and I think that's especially true if you're someone that has um, maybe spent a lot of time online. You know, there's so many things online about co-parenting and sharing care of children. And, you know, have a look at if you're reading something, does it feel helpful for you? Does it feel like it's nurturing you and giving you something to think about? If you feel like it's just making you feel bad about what's happening, then maybe that isn't a helpful resource for you right at this moment. So, Ina, from the perspective of supporting children's secure emotional attachment, what is co-parenting all about? <laughs> well, I'm very happy to share my view. And I'm just wondering, can you bring that um, hands holding hands graphic? Yes, I can. Um, yeah, and I'll, um, I'll, I'll use this graphic to explain my thinking. There we go. Can you see it okay, Ina? Yeah, I can. Yep, yeah, I can see it. Um, can you put so this kind of on uh, the whole screen? I mean, there's yeah. like things on this side as well. Yeah, I just hang on. Where are we? Yep, there we go. Oh, brilliant! Thank you. So, um, so in a minute, I'll talk you through this graphic and how it applies to co-parenting. But you know, before I want to say um, where it came from, it was created by a team of. Uh, three clinical psychologists uh, from Circle of Security International. Uh, they have amazing resources. If you look them up online, I, I highly recommend them. And so basically what they did, they looked at the, like literally thousands of studies into secure attachment that have been done over the last 50 years. And there's a lot of jargon that in them. And what they did, they translated what we now know into a simple graphics, simple language that people who need this knowledge the most, which is parents, can actually take it and use it in their day-to-day -day parenting. And that's what I hope this graphic will help you to do. Like, you know, in the heat of the moment, in that handover on when you got that text, when you need to make a decision about the birthday party, you can take that and use that to order your thinking. Mm -hmm. So, um, so there's a few things that I just love about this graphic. So first of all, it helps to cut through the noise. Like, you know, all of these things that we just spoke about, they can be so present, but actually like none of that is about your child. <laughs> and when you think about this graphic, it helps you to focus on the child and think about what do they need and also it helps you to think about what does my child need right now? Mm -hmm. Letting go of the worries, or at least pausing the worries about what happened in the future, um, what happened in the past, or what will happen in the future, and just arrive into that moment. And also it can help you to focus on what you, you can do and what your role is in that situation. And um, yeah, so, and do what's within your reach rather than worrying about like what other people are doing or not, not doing. Um, yeah, so after this introduction, <laughs> I'll start going through the graphic. So you see, um, so uh, there are four main parts in this graphic. There's a little pair of hands, and uh, so that's the first bit, and then there's a circle that's that is coming out of the little pair of hands and there's a top of the circle and the bottom of the circle and the fourth part is that big pair of hands yes. so <coughs> uh, so the small pair of hands um, is you secure base and safe haven for your child and and committing to be that consistent reliable uh, presence for your child is 
I believe the biggest commitment and the biggest gift you can give to your child, you know, when they have that trust, that certainty that somebody has their back, somebody will be there for them no matter what. I mean, as much as humanely possible, of course, um, creates that trust in their own goodness, goodness of other people, goodness of the world, that sense of emotional security. Did you want to add something, Louisa? No, I just uh, I was just remembering how much I love this graphic because I think it just takes something and all of the noise and just really simplifies it to focus mm. on, you know, as you've said, what your child needs right now. And I think that yeah. just, uh, you know, so important. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, and then once children, know, once children know where their secure base is, they begin to move in, 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 in a circle. And I'm sure you've seen like, thousands of t- times in your parenting and so the top of that circle represents children's exploration when they're playing uh, spending time with their friends discovering something new they might be in their own thoughts thinking about something you know it's the time when they're developing different skills they are developing mastery and they need your support to be able to engage with that kind of both emotionally and physically safe space for them to um, do their exploration. And you see this of different stages, whichever me, delighted me, helped me, enjoy with me. You know, I could go on for hours, but I won't go into (laughs) much much more detail into this now. So, and so children need your support to explore. And after a while, once they've been exploring, they move right to the other side of the circle and that is a transition point when that impulse to explore and experience something new changes into an opposite impulse and that is to come back in and that is the bottom of the circle. They might be tired or overwhelmed or confused or hungry for whatever reason they're looking to come back. They're looking for the comfort, for for protection. They're looking for help to make sense of what they just experienced. And um, so and the top of the circle and the bottom of the circle are like, it's, the way I think is about it is like breathing. You know, you inhale and then you exhale. Both are just important for healthy development and emotional security. Or it's like... You know, two wings that birds need to fly. One is mastery of certain skills, and the other one is being comfortable in in close relationships. Um, And then we come to the fourth bit, the hands holding hands. And, you know, we all know that being that secure base and safe haven for a child is a massive task. And if you are unsupported in that task, like, you know, very soon you will begin to feel like that magician. He's trying to just pull out the rabbits of the hat (laughs) and there's no more rabbits left. So that support, that village is um, really, really important for you to be able to then support your children. Yeah. And um, so we'll talk how that applies to co-parenting in a minute and you know, just to kind of uh, to close the introduction of that graphic, like I see it as, you know, when you have that clarity, clear list of areas that I need to focus on is like going shopping with a very well thought through shopping list. And, you know, instead of looking at all the labels and the shiny things and trying to sort of look after all the moving pieces, you can let all that be and just arrive into that space. Okay what do I need to do, what does my child need, and be present with, um, uh, what's, what might be most important in that situation. Louisa, over to you. Yeah, I, I, when you put it like that, it really cuts through the noise of everything else, and sort of brings it back to the fundamentals, and I think, you know, as a parent myself, that makes sense to me, that whole kind of focusing in on what's really important, 
rather than being caught up in all of the you know the external noise in the background and um, and i think it's really interesting as well to kind of relate it to co-parenting and in terms of that secure base mm. yeah 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 so um i think shall we break it down a little bit further yeah, I think that would be helpful, and particularly to sort of look at it from that <laughs> co-parenting angle. Mm. Yeah, so I think the way we decided to do it, we'll go through those same um, sort of four areas and see how we can use that graphic to counteract those pressures mm. and to just make things a bit simpler and hopefully easier for you. Yeah. So, you know, the first point about yourself and um, I think one of the questions that can be so helpful is a simple question. How can I be a secure pair of hands for my child in this moment? You know, even like if I'm tired or angry or fed up, I can just think, okay, is my child on the top of the circle or the bottom of the circle? Do they need their exploration supported or do they need the comfort right now? And um, so there's two, um, sorry, I got in a bit in a bit of a muddle. Those were the sort of, I was going to talk about a bit further down the line. So let's take a little breath and um, how this graphic can help you to be the secure base. It basically um, tells that there are four areas um, or to be the secure base and support your child's sense of security. There's four areas that are most important to focus on. So first thing is committing to being um, the secure base for your child. Just being present as those hands on the circle being that bigger, stronger, wiser, and kind person uh, pretty consistently for your child. And I know it's, it's, it's not a small task, but at least the clarity is there. Mm -hmm. So, and once you're there, it's about, it, it's hard to talk about the circle without going into too much detail. And I'm kind of conscious to kind of not to overwhelm you with too much detail. So, I'll say that there is a balance between following a child's need to support their exploration and welcoming them in for comfort on one hand, following a child's need, but on the other hand, being able to take charge of the situation and um, saying, okay, this is what's happening. It's bedtime or it's time to get ready for school. And there are times when you can't follow um, so, you know, if, if they want to explore and play, you can't let them play. So I'm just saying that um, to not put too much pressure on you, like if you're thinking, oh, my God, like now I just have to look out when they want to play and when they when they want comfort. Uh, it's not like that. It's it's a balance. So <clears throat> just to, uh, use your um, judgment. Yeah. When you think about how you're going to apply this um, to your parenting. And then when it comes to um, co-parenting, I think that's where the bigger pair of hands come in. Because um, what happens, children can have a number of secure bases that they can trust with, trust, you know, say at least seven they can attach to seven people and feel really safe and at ease with. And so when children go to the other parent, that transition happens, then the other parent becomes the secure base, secure pair of hands for the children. And then they need to be uh, supported in their role. So I think, and that brings us to, to the second point about this thinking, um, so about co-parenting relationship. And I think, again, what I like about the circle is that it can help you to maybe step back and take a different perspective on what's, what's happening in the co-parenting relationship. Because 
I think sometimes it might be easy to overlook the positive positives, especially if you're still hurting from the separation or just kind of got into that grief or resentment and everything seems wrong. When you step back, you might notice that, well, actually, you know, they are there and, you know, they do take them to play dates or to places or swimming or whatever. And they also like reasonably okay with welcoming them in, like feeding and cuddling them and snuggling up and reading a story. And um, so, yeah, it can help you see more positives in the other parents' parenting, but it also, it can help you to, and you know, that might be a sad and painful process to go through, to acknowledge that those positives are just not there because sometimes, you know, Lisa, with all, all of those external pressures that we have and internal pressures, you know, you might be working so hard to create that good relationship for your child with their other parent, but, you know, you realize that actually the commitment is just not there. Mm. That other parent is not showing up as a secure base for the child. And of course you can, you know, you can support them, but ultimately it is their own decision and it's for them to step up and show up and you know they might need more support than you can provide to really be that uh, secure base and safe haven for your children yeah yeah that all that that all that all makes sense to me particularly sort of putting it into the context of seeing couples that are separating come together and the sort of things that come out and I I think you've hit the nail on the head in terms of the fact that you know there can sometimes be a tendency to look for the the things that aren't happening rather than looking at the things that are happening but equally I think it's important to recognize that you know sometimes there are very few positives to find for people and that can be a, a, a tricky situation to find yourself in in itself yeah 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 so I think now we sort of spoke about two extremes and now if we come back into more like the middle area where co-parenting is going reasonably well, you know, I think a helpful question to um, keep asking yourself is how can I support the other parent to be the secure base when the children are with them? And, you know, <laughs> I want to acknowledge that it can be a tricky question. It, it can bring so much, especially if you feel like you're doing most of the parenting and most of the caring. And then you think, like, oh, my God, it's like now another thing I have to do. And um, so if that's you, I invite you to think about, you know, again, about that village. And the more people are around you and your children, the more people are in, in your village the more you will benefit. And mm -hmm. if you think about the other parent as one person in, in, in their village, in your village, it, uh, it, might, it might make it easier for you to yeah, just look for, for their ways of supporting the other parent. Now, <coughs> please, I'm just wondering, do you have any sort of practical suggestions like, uh, you know, what can be done? And, I'm thinking about like sharing information about what's happening at school or like, um, you know, what they like to eat lately or medication, things like that. Yeah, I, th I think that's something that people can often find really difficult, particularly if you've got two parents who are finding it tricky to communicate because maybe there's still a lot of issues that are um, very fresh for both of them and they are finding that they trigger each other, maybe because it's really early days, maybe because there's a new partner on the scene. Those kind of things can often be triggers for talking and communicating to become more difficult. And often it can be helpful for parents to kind of look at ways that they can be helped to communicate. So. For example, I always say to both parents that if they both talk to the school, then they can both get information from the children's school. So that enables them to get information about when sports days are, you know, when the 
services or uh, are that you might want to attend where your children are you know singing a song or saying a line those kind of things and if they both get that information then it enables them both to kind of make arrangements to attend and I think that can be something that can reduce a bit of resentment because I think sometimes there can be one parent who feels like they're the ones that always says don't forget this is happening on that date. Don't forget that's happening on that date. So a really easy fix for that is to make sure that both parents get all communication from the school and they can then put those dates in their diary and that can sort of address that particular aspect. Another thing that I think is used in situations where separated parents are finding it hard to talk about is having a book that they both write in where they include important information. Mm. So that might be information like, um, you know, uh, Billy had a headache at, and I gave him cow pollen at three o'clock. You know, this is where I think communication is really important because if your child has had a painkiller, the other parent needs to know about it because if Billy's still complaining of the same headache at half past four when he goes back to the other parent, you don't want there to have been two doses of medicine in a very short space of time because we all know that's not a good thing. And um, it can also include things about, you know, and if a child's been particularly upset or if they fell over in the park and they've grazed their knee just so that the other parents are aware of it um, and also you know I have dealt with situations where they each parent writes in what the child has eaten so that where there's been issues about you feed the child you know you're always giving Billy hamburgers or stuff that I don't find nutritious and actually the parents can just write in had lasagna pasta whatever it is for lunch and that can just help to kind of alleviate those concerns and one of the things that I when you have that book I always say if it goes backwards and forwards with your children if they're old enough to read it bear in mind that they might read it at some <laughs> so you know it's helpful to put constructive comments about nice things and not to use it in any way kind of you know make a cheap point or say something negative and um, that's the way that I always encourage parents to use that kind of book mm. and, you know that's helpful for people that are you know not always on top of details about things like that as well because if when you were together one person tended to marry and manage those kind of things and it's not something that is immediately um you know one person can struggle to get to grips with that having that written down notes can be quite useful that they can refer back to and you know make notes in and all of those kind of things yeah yeah so so shall we move on to talking about how it applies to managing the pressures that might be coming from family and friends yeah i think that would be a kind of helpful next step um and i really I come back to the point that I know you've made a lot about taking a village to raise a child mm. and you know anybody who's a parent knows that it is hard and it is tough and there are always moments where you know you think things can't get any worse and you know I always think about your children being ill in the middle of the night when you're really tired or you've been ill yourself and it's finding that extra bit of reserve and it can be draining and I think doubly so when you know doubly triply even more so when you are someone who is separated from the other parent and you're managing stuff on your own and that's where that whole village really does come in because if you're exhausting yourself then you're going to need a break and you're going to end up in a situation where you're not being able to you know be the best person that you want to be so that's when the sort of extended family support can come in whether that's you know can you please come round and cook dinner? Can you please look after the children so I can just have an hour to myself or I can go for a swim, I can go for a massage, I can just go for a walk, whatever it is. And as you've already identified as well, they can be that secure base for your child. A secure base doesn't just have to be mum and dad. It can be grandparents, close friends, you know, lots of different people. It can even be someone like a childminder or a nanny as well. You know, they may be able to help you offer a bit of extra childcare if you need it. You know, I often talk to clients, separating from someone is really hard administratively as well as emotionally because you've often got 
appointments you've got to go to, you've got paperwork you've got to complete. So sometimes having a bit of extra childcare can really help with that. Yeah. And the other point about the sort of extended family and village is that they can also support the other parent and help yeah. them be a secure base. So they can offer, you know, they might be your mum or your friend, but there's no reason why they still can't help out the other parent with childcare or with something that they need you know whatever it might be they can help support the other parent as well was there anything to add on that una no i think i think um yeah i think you covered it uh fully shall we talk about media yeah i mean i i don't think i have that much more to say on that other than you know, if you're getting information from the media and it's making you feel down about what's happening for you or the way that you're co-parenting, then maybe that's just not the right resource for you. And sometimes it's not, you know, you have to find something that resonates with you. And I do think resonating means it has to be something that helps you and is not just to sort of, you know, stick to beat yourself with metaphorically speaking. Mm yeah yeah so i hope that you know if you're still watching this video you have this frame of reference that can help you to decide um how to show up as a parent in a tricky moment how to steer the relationship with the other parent and your family and friends like what do you want to take from media and what you don't um so i hope that you feel really inspired and just have that sense that, you know, things at the moment are not quite working. They're not quite comfortable. They don't have to be the same. And I'm sure you will agree with me, Louisa. Yeah, I'm just going to stop sharing the graphic for now so that we can go back. <laughs> yeah. I, I, one of the points I make to clients in mediation is no one can change what's happened up until this point. And we all know that we may have, you know, done things we're not proud of, said things that we wish we could turn back time and change. We can't. But what you can do is you can draw a line in the sand and say, that's how things were up until this point. But now I'm going to look at the future and see how things are going to be different going forward. And, you know, I, th I think that's quite empowering for people to know that even if things haven't been great up until now, they can get better and you can change things. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And that's part of the reason why we're creating this video to provide um, that support for you because we spoke a lot about having the village around you and so professional support can be part of that village that supports you. So Lisa, would you say a few words about how mediation can help co-parents? Yeah, definitely. I think one of the things about mediation is that it brings both parents together and it brings them together in a sort of quasi formal professional environment. So if discussions between the two of you end in an explosive row, it's much less likely to happen with a mediator. And what I bring as a mediator is to give information and to structure discussions so that you can say, right, you know, we are at step two and we'd like to get to step six but this is what we're going to do to go to step three and map out what baby steps will look like to kind of take you forwards. And it also enables both parents to get an understanding of each other's perspectives. And that doesn't always mean that they agree with each other, but just having that understanding of where each other are coming from can be really important in trying to, to move things forward. And so I, I, I would say those are the kind of how main benefits of how mediation can change things for parents and you know talk to me a bit about what you do with separating parents and how you can help them to move forward if they're finding things difficult as well mm -hmm. yes well definitely if they're finding things difficult but i also want to add like you don't need to wait until things are difficult yeah. if you just have a concern really? if things are quite good and you want to make sure the children are okay and you know it stays that way it's also a really good reason to get in touch with me so i help parents you know right at any point of separation you know you might be just beginning to think about separation and you want to plan it and 
transition in a way that is least disruptive for your children. You might be already in the middle or you might have separated a while ago and all of a sudden things have exploded or ran into difficulties. And um, I mostly work with parents, sometimes with parents and children. And I help parents to embody being that secure base for their child, finding their own version that feels true and comfortable for them. And I help them to create, find new ways of connecting with their children um, and sort of deepen, strengthen their relationship. And um, every family, every situation is different. And that's why I think the best way to start is just for us to meet either in person or online and to have a free initial consultation for one hour where we can talk and um, to see whether we want to work together or not to take it from there. And where can people find you, Ina? What's the best place to start? Is it your mm -hmm. website or? Yeah. Uh, my website is parentingafterseparation.co.uk and I'm sure we'll put both of our contact details somewhere around this video because um, I'm going to post this video on my website as well so it might be helpful for you to share your contact details. Yep, anyone can find out more about mediation and get in touch with me via my website which is www.lkwfamilymediation.co.uk um, yeah, and I'm sure contact details will be around, but at least with the website addresses, it means people have a, have a starting point. Mm. So, Lisa, thank you so much. It's been quite a process thinking it through, preparing, recording this. Um, you know, it's been a great pleasure. And, you know, for you, um, I hope it was really helpful and useful and um just wish all the best for your parenting and co-parenting yeah I, I think I definitely echo those thoughts I I always I love working with people who have a different professional background because I think it just brings another perspective and you it just makes you think more from different angles and hopefully that can only benefit you know clients and parents that we work with so thank you Una mm. okay <sighs> Right. We'll say bye for now then. Yeah, bye. Bye.